As the years go by, and I experience and see all the things and the tragedy and pain and struggles around the world, around our country, around our community, um, and, and as your mind kind of says, what's the solution? What's the answer to all the craziness and all the conflict and all the, you know, what's the answer? More and more as the years go by, my heart just comes back to this one simple reality, the presence and the love and the grace and the power of Jesus. Until hearts are changed by the presence of Jesus, families won't change, communities won't change, states won't change, nations won't change, the world won't change. It's the power and the presence of Jesus. And we need to be people who are committed to sharing the good news that we've found. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've come to the cross, received his grace, and become his follower, you should be living with this heart that says, God, I don't always know how to do it exactly right, and sometimes I get nervous, but here I am. Use me to share your love with this world, to share the story of Jesus. And so I want to begin our time today with just two simple prayers. The first prayer is for those of you that have already come to the cross, that have already received Jesus. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we pray, whether we're at home or in the courtyard or in the worship center, wherever we are today, if we have put our faith in you, Jesus, will you speak to our hearts today? Will you give us a new boldness, a new courage to naturally, organically share your love, your truth, your good news with the world? That's our prayer. Give us courage to listen to this message and speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and it's showing there's always lots of people online, on campus that are checking out the whole Jesus thing, trying to understand it. Maybe you've been coming for weeks or months or years and you haven't taken that step to follow Jesus. I want to lead you in a prayer. And I hope you have the courage to pray this prayer. So if you're here and you say, you know what? I'm not yet a follower of Jesus, but I like Shoreline. I'm checking it out. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, I'm praying not even 100% sure that you're real. And God, if you're there, Heavenly Father, if you love me and care about me, Lord, I pray you'd show yourself to me. Show me who Jesus is this day. Show me his love and his kindness and his goodness. My heart's open, Lord. My mind's open. If you'll show yourself to me, I will be open to follow you. I pray this, hoping that this is all real. In the name of Jesus, amen. I hope you prayed one of those prayers. I I pray that your heart is open today. Today we're concluding an eight-week journey and just answering this simple question, and that is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? A disciple? A disciple? It's just a follower of Jesus. An organic disciple is somebody who follows Jesus in natural ways. Not fabricated, not creepy, not weird, just following Jesus, living for Jesus. So organic disciples walk with Jesus. And if you say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that 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 we're growing in Bible engagement. An organic disciple is growing to know and love and follow this book. Christians have one book that we follow. This is it. We believe it's God's word. So are you growing to know and love and follow the word of God? How do I know I'm growing up as I follow Jesus? Well, passionate prayer. I'm learning to pray and talk to him. Not just at the start of a day or before a meal, but just through the flow of my life. I'm learning to recognize his voice when the Holy Spirit whispers to me. I'm praying with other Christians about stuff. It's just becoming more natural for me. That's part of being an organic disciple. How do I know I'm growing up in faith? Wholehearted worship. I'm learning to worship God and praise him, not just for an hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday morning, but all week long, that you worship him, you praise him. 
Like the Apostle Paul says, you offer your body, all you are is a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, living for him, worshiping him all week long. That's part of the journey of being an organic disciple. Humble service. I'm growing like Jesus to take a hand and reach it out and say to somebody, can I help you? You notice a need. You don't wait for someone to ask you. Just step in and help where you can. You serve in the church. You serve at your school. You serve in your neighborhood. You serve at the workplace. You serve wherever you are, humbly, in the name of Jesus. Then you're becoming more and more like Jesus. You're following after him. And then joyful generosity. You start to live with a sense that, God, my heart is the greatest treasure I have. I give it to you, and with it, everything else. And you just joyfully say, God, every gift I have, my ability to think, to do, to do math, to teach, to drive a truck, to, to serve a, in a restaurant, to do law, whatever, whatever I, the gifts I have, you give them to me. So now as you provide, Lord, I joyfully give back to you. That's part of growing to be a disciple, part of that natural journey. And then consistent community. To say, Lord, I, I, I love your people. All of them imperfect, including me but we're learning to be your family together and we grow as a community. That's part of your journey. How do I know I'm growing as a Christian? These things are becoming more and more naturally a part of who I am. And this eighth one, or the seventh one, is not last because it's least important. It's actually last because the final thing Jesus said before he left this planet, when God came among us, Jesus Emmanuel, the last thing he said after he rose from the dead, showed up and, and, and just you know, spoke to his disciples in different places and different times before he went back to heaven, He said, you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, right where you live, you'll share about me. In Judea, the surrounding community, you'll share about me. In Samaria, the places you don't want to go, you'll actually go there and share about me all the way to the ends of the earth. He says, you will be my my witnesses. He says, go therefore and you make disciples, followers of me, of all nations. You'll baptize them In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you'll teach them everything I've taught you. And then Jesus says, I'll be with you to the very end of the age. The Gospel of Matthew ends that way. The book of Acts begins that way. Right before Jesus goes back to heaven, he says this, share your faith naturally. That's that's the call. That's the heart of Jesus. So here's the question. Is organic outreach possible in our current cultural context? In the world we live in right now, some people are like, oh, you can't share faith with people now because they'll freak out, they'll get angry, they'll get defensive. Our world's so combative, and we can't do that. But before you start to think, well, I can't share my faith in our world today because it's such a tough, hostile place, let me take you back to Jesus' days in the first century when he told his disciples, you go and share about me all around the world. Jesus understood, and they understood, that if they did that, they might die for their faith. And some of them did. You're like, you're like, well, but, but if I share my faith, someone might look at me funny and I might feel mildly dis, you know, uncomfortable. So can I do it? It's like, you know, they, these are people who are willing to die for their faith. Our mild discomfort is pretty tame comparatively. So don't look and say, well, I can't do organic outreach. I can't share my faith naturally because it's going to freak people out. Because you know what the truth is? For the most part, it won't. People who know you and love you and have gotten to know you, they like you. And you know part of the reason they like you is there's something different about you. It's Jesus in you. So say, God, could you use that? Could you share that with others? So as we always begin with anything we want to kind of grow in as a Christian, we begin with Jesus. We're disciples of Jesus, so we watch him, we study his life, and we learn from Jesus. And so what about the heart of Jesus? The heart of Jesus is to love and save people like you and not like you. The heart of Jesus is to save people who are lost and wandering, like sheep wandering without a shepherd. People just like you, who think like you and look like you and act like you. And he came to save save people who look and think and act nothing like you. Because Jesus came to seek and save anyone and everyone who's lost. That was the heart of Jesus. As a matter of fact, it's so much his heart that when you watch the life of Jesus, you see him naturally reaching out to people everywhere he went. Now, here's the thing about evangelism or outreach. I use the term organic outreach. It's a biblical concept of sharing our story and the story of Jesus and the love of Jesus with the world. We worry that, that people are going to, that, that well, the way we do it, it's going to have to be so abrasive and turn people off. But let me ask you a question. Who showed you Jesus? Where did you see Jesus? Where did you learn about Jesus? Who loved you and told you the story of Jesus and the goodness of Jesus? 
Was it a dad or mom, a grandpa or a grandma, aunt or an uncle, a youth leader, a youth pastor, a neighbor who loved Jesus? Who was it who shared Jesus with you? And here's my question. Were they mean, nasty, and abrasive? And the answer is probably no. They weren't like, you need Jesus or you're going to hell. That's what they, they weren't, most weren't, okay? Maybe one or two, but most people weren't. They were just like, they loved Jesus and they talked about their faith and they just were themselves and it was part of who they were. And that's what God wants for you. He wants you to be that person for someone else where you, you just know Jesus, you love him, he's part of your life. You talk about him because he's your dearest friend. You talk about him because he's changed your life. You reach out to them and you invite them to stuff because you want them to know God's love too. It's, it's organic. It's reaching out naturally. And that's what God wants for us. And, and, and so you look at Jesus, and this was the way of Jesus. This was the heart of Jesus. Jesus had a mission statement. It's in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Here's Jesus' mission statement. It's short, it's snappy, it's clear. To seek and save the lost. Jesus, what's your mission? Why'd you come to this world? I think Jesus would have said, to seek and save the lost. That's what he told people back in his day. He saw people who are lost and wandering and broken and hurting and marginalized. Rich and poor. Insiders, outsiders. Every tongue, tribe, nation, and people, the Bible says. All of them. And Jesus came to seek, look for them, and save them from their sin. That's the heart of Jesus. That's the way that Jesus was and he still is today. So when you look at Jesus and you understand who he is, you see his mission, you see his heart. So here's the question. What's in a name? You know, what's in a name? You have, you know, my Kevin Garth Harney. I can tell you a whole story behind my name, about my first name, my middle name, my last name. But, you know, they have meaning to them, some family history. But in the ancient world, names meant so much. And people were given different names or descriptions of who they were. So when you look at the names of Jesus and who he was, you get a sense of why he came to this world, what his mission was. And, and so here's one of the names. Here's one of the names of Jesus. Jesus was called the Messiah. He was called the Messiah. In John 4 and other places. The, the name Messiah means savior or liberator. The Messiah came to save, to liberate people. I feel like I'm like making noise and popping ears. Is it bugging anybody else or just me? A little bit, nodding heads. So I don't know if there's a way we can make me less poppy. Maybe it's just I'm feeling poppy today. Maybe that's what it is. Okay, good. I'll let you, I'll let you work on that. But, but Jesus, Jesus was the Messiah. He came as the Savior, the liberator from sin, from death, from hell, from the grave. He saved us from all of that. He sets us free. Jesus was called the bread of heaven in John chapter 6. If people are hungry and longing and feeling empty inside, the bread of heaven is not the bread of earth. It's the bread of heaven. He fills us. He satisfies us. That's Jesus. That's the one, that, that's the one we're supposed to become more and more like. He was the living water. Jesus said, if people are thirsty and just, just longing, just their souls are parched, Jesus says, I will fill you up to overflowing with himself, he offers himself, living water. The light of the world. In this dark, dark world, Jesus said, I come and I penetrate this world with my light and my presence. That's Jesus. That's the one that, that we follow. That's the one who offered his life for the world. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This comes up again and again in the Gospels. Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In the first century, there was, this, there was this practice of offering sacrifices, animal after animal after animal. It went back for centuries. And when Jesus came, the Lamb of God, he paid the final sacrifice, the final price, and he put an end to all those animal sacrifices. If you like animals, say, hooray. <laughs> no more of that, right? He said, no, it's done because I am the Lamb of God. I will lay my life down I'll give it for you. I'll pay the price. I'll rise again. I'll offer it to you. That's the heart of Jesus, the Lamb of God. He's the gate. Jesus is called the gate. You know what he's saying? He's saying the way to heaven, the way to new life, the way to hope. Jesus says, there's a gate here. Jesus says, I'm the gate. And if you ask me, I'm going to open right up. There's no other way. But Jesus says, anyone who asks, I'll open the gate. Come on in. He invites us to come and be in relationship with him and with his Father. Jesus is the resurrection and the life the resurrection and the life. We look at this life and we cling to it so tightly, but Jesus Christ lets us know that he has power over the grave 
And because he died on the cross, paid for our sins, and rose again, anyone who accepts him as their resurrection, as their life, who confesses their sins and takes his hand to follow Jesus, this life is not the end. Do you know for many people, they see this life as the end. The end of this life is the beginning of eternity. And if you follow Jesus, that eternity is more glorious than anything you can imagine or dream. This is the Jesus that we worship. And if you were to ask this Jesus, what are you doing here? When Jesus came and walked on this earth, and people ask this question, who are you? Why are you here? What are you doing? What's your mission? If you ask Jesus, what's your mission? What are you doing here? Jesus would say things like this, and he did. He he would say, I'm here to reveal the love of the Father, that your heavenly Father who made you, he loves you. Jesus revealed the love of the Father. He'd say, I'm here to share the truth of the Father, that God came among us, Emmanuel, Jesus, to reveal the truth of heaven, the truth of the Father. He would say, I offer the grace of the Father, undeserved, unearned, lavish goodness from heaven. He said, I want you to know the Father wants to lavish your life with grace, amazing and true. Jesus would say, I came to proclaim the gospel of the Father. There's good news from heaven that God loves you so much, he would pay the price for all your wrongs and invite you into his family. Jesus would say, I came to bring, bring that gospel, that good news. Jesus, why, are you, why did you come? What are you doing here? He said, I come to invite you to repentance, to repentance toward the Father. In other words, when people don't know Jesus, they don't know the Father, we're walking in our own way, going our own direction, walking away from God. And Jesus says, I call you to repent. Here's repentance. You're going this way, you turn around, and you go the other way. Repentance is a complete turning around. And instead of walking from the Father, you begin to walk toward the Father. Jesus, I came to invite you back to the Father. His arms are open. He welcomes you. Jesus, what are you doing here? Why did you come walk on this earth? To pay the price for sin against the Father. We have sinned against a perfectly holy God. And our sin separates us from God and from each other. And Jesus came and said, I came to bring that back together, to pay the price for that sin, to reconcile you to the one who made you and who loves you. That's the heart of Jesus. That's the mission of Jesus. Jesus, why did you come? He came to call us to follow the Father. This is discipleship and evangelism. This is what being an organic disciple is. He says, I, can't, I call you just to walk with the Father, to follow, to go in the ways of the Father, to, to worship this God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to walk in his ways and to follow after him. Jesus calls us to do that. So, so you begin, when you think about any part of your, your own spiritual journey, you start with Jesus, who he was, what he did, why he came. And Jesus came to seek and save the lost. So here's the journey. We look at Jesus. We learn from Jesus. That was his mission. That was his calling. That's what he did day in and day out, all the way to going to the cross, rising again, conquering sin, death, and hell. So what does it mean to be a disciple? It means we're becoming more and more like Jesus. So here's what happens. Then we say, then, his mission is our mission. We say, his, the mission of Jesus becomes my mission. And the question is, do you see it? Do you recognize that Jesus came to seek and save the lost? So if you're a Christian, what's your mission? Seek and save the lost. To do what he did. That's that's what Christians do. We learn from Jesus. We watch him and we try the best we can with our own struggles and frailties and stumbling along the way, but we try to be part of his mission to seek and to save the lost. So we talked about who Jesus is, but when you follow him, you become his person, then what you discover is who you are. So, 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 but, but who am I? Who am I? Do you know that a lot of God's best people through the Bible, when God would call them to do something great, you know what their response was? Who am I? Again and again, people say, well, who am I? They'd say it with those words or their actions, like, I don't deserve, I don't deserve to, to, to serve you, God. I'm just being restored by your love and your grace. Who am I to be called out to serve? But to answer that question, who am I? If you're a follower of Jesus, what you discover is this. In Matthew chapter 4, You discover that you are a fisher of people. When Jesus called the early disciples, many of them were fishermen. So Jesus says, okay, you've been fishing for fish your whole life? Okay, we're going to do something like that, but kind of different. You're going to fish for people. Why? Because they're lost. And we're going to go on a mission to reach them, to seek and save the lost. If you're a follower of Jesus, brand new Christian for two or three days, or been a Christian for 75 years, you are a fisher of people. 
to share his love with the world and invite them in. You become a conduit of living water. That the water of Jesus, in, in John chapter 4, Jesus is talking with this, woman, this Samaritan woman. He's explaining that when you come to Jesus, his living water fills you so much. It's like living water, moving water, percolating water that fills you and just overflows. So you go to your workplace and you overflow with the living water of Jesus. You go to your school, you overflow with the living water of Jesus. You go to your neighborhood, into your family, if you have non-Christians in your family, in your home, and you overflow with the water of Jesus. But it's natural. It's not like, okay, you're, you're now my sledgehammer. He says, you're living water. You overflow with the joy and the love and the presence of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus makes it clear that if you follow him, you are the light of the world. You become a light in this world. Now, let me be clear about something. If you think about the sun and the moon, okay, the moon, how much light does the moon have? Only as much as reflects off the sun. The moon doesn't emanate light. But when the sun hits, have you ever, have you ever been out at nighttime, like late at night, and there's like a full moon, and the, the sun is hitting it, and it's reflecting, I mean, it's the reflection of the sun on you, and you go out at night, and you're like, I can see. I mean, not like perfectly in the daytime, but have you ever had that experience where you go, I can actually, it's, like, it's like, almost like day, it's so bright out here. That's your life. We're the light in this, in this way, that Jesus is the light of the world. And the more closely you walk with him, the more his light shines on you. It reflects off you. And like the moon reflects the light of the sun, you reflect the light of Jesus. So people looking at you, they see his light. They're not seeing your light. They're seeing his light reflected off you. But that's, she says, that's who you are. And then he says, you're the salt of the earth. In Matthew chapter five, you are the salt of the earth. And we know what salt does. Salt makes people thirsty, right? People taste some salt. They begin to thirst. For what? For something that will refresh them. For fresh water. Well, he's the living water. So you go out and just your presence sprinkles the salt. And people look and they say, man, I watched how you walked through that really hard time and you were strong and confident. What's that about you? What's, what is that about you? Why can you stand so strong in hard times? That's salt. And you say, oh, it's the power of Jesus. They're thirsting for what they see in you. You live your life for Jesus and it becomes like salt in this world because people long for what he offers. And then he comes as the living water. We partner with Jesus in his mission in this world. And it's a glorious opportunity. But we, we just tend to say, well, who am I? You know, I, I don't think that, that God, God could use someone like me. I talk to so many Christians that would say, well, okay, Bible engagement, I, I can do that. I can, I can read my Bible and learn. Passionate prayer, I want to grow in prayer. Organic outreach, naturally share the love of Jesus. Well, that's not one, that one's not for me. Who am I to do that? I mean, I'm just, if you knew my background, if you knew my past, you would know. I can't go talk about Jesus. I'm a hypocrite. It's like, well, join the club. You know what a hypocrite is? Somebody who doesn't perfectly live up to what they believe. Well, you believe one thing and sometimes you live differently. Sure do. You know why? Because God's standard is perfect and I'm not there yet. And I know a lot of you. And can I say as your pastor... Neither are you. So there you go, okay? I love you, but let's be honest, right? And so we don't, we don't just act hypocritically on purpose, but you know, we don't perfectly live up to what the standards that we know we're called to. But, but don't let it be an excuse to not shine the light of Jesus and be his presence. So think through the Bible. Book of Exodus, Moses. When God comes to Moses, says, Moses, you're gonna go and you're, and you're gonna set the people free and I'm gonna use you in this great mission. What does Moses say? He actually literally says, who am I? Who am I? that I should go. You know what God says? Don't think about who you are. Think about who I am. God says, I am, and I'm with you. Ah, okay. So he presses into that mission, and God uses him in great ways. Think about Esther. You'll find Esther in the book of Esther. Not a trick question. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament, the book of Esther. I'm a prisoner of war. I'm, I'm a, a foreigner in this land. Who am I? And God says to her, you're going to go to the king. And you're going to speak on my behalf. You know, you know what Esther says? I will go, and if I die, I die. That's commitment. Who am I? You're a child of God. That's who you are. Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus. A young girl. No power in her world. Who am I? But when the angel comes and speaks to her, you know what she says? Let it be to me, let it be to me as the Lord has said. Let it be. Let God's will be done in my life. Saul, in the book of Acts, this guy Saul, is he hates Christians. He's going around destroying churches, murdering Christians. 
That's what he's doing when God calls him. And when God calls him, he becomes a Christian. His name is changed from, from Saul to Paul. And now God says, now you go and share this message of Jesus with the world. And you know what at one point he says? He says, I'm the worst of all sinners. I persecuted the church. He knew who he was. But you know what else he knew? He knew who Jesus was. And Jesus was in him. So you read in the New Testament, in your Bible, the book of Romans. You know who God inspired to write that book? This guy named Paul. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You know who God inspired to write those books? Paul. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. You know who God inspired to write those books? Paul. Murderer of Christians. Don't say, who am I? I can't do it. Say, who is God? And he can do it through me. Amen? Amen. You can be used by God to share his light and his love if you're willing to, if you're open to. So I want to talk about our next steps toward kind of walking, you know, toward, toward and with Jesus, going toward Jesus, but also serving him. We look at Jesus and we learn that he, his mission was to seek and save the lost. We say, okay, and then, now he says, you, you, you are going to be a conduit of living water. You're going to be, a, you know, you're, you're going to be, you're going to shine the light. I'm going to reflect my light off of you. He says, you're going you're to be my missionary people going wherever I send you. So then how do we begin to walk into that? I want you just to quiet your heart if you're a follower of Jesus and just, uh, just think about these things that may help you start walking in this place of saying, God, here I am, I'm scared, I'm nervous, I don't know exactly what to do, but I want to I wanna learn to share your faith with other people. I want to shine your light. How do you take steps toward that? Here's one. Admit my fear or concerns to God and other believers. If you're nervous, if you're afraid, tell God about it. Say, God, man, when Pastor Kim is talking about organic outreach and sharing my faith, it just scares me to death. But God, I'm talking to you, I'm telling you, I'm afraid. But I, here I am. You can use me. Make yourself available. Check my theology. What do I believe? Do we believe that when, G, that, that when the Apostle Paul, uh, when, when the New Testament says that, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him, do we believe that he is truly the way to the Father? Check your theology. Do you believe that? Oh, there's many ways to God. No, there's not. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do I believe that? Check my theology. I want to own my calling. To say, God, if you call me, I'll follow. Listen for his voice. Right when you become a Christian, he fills you with his Holy Spirit and he calls you because you're a Christian, but he's also gonna open doors for you to share his love with people. Do you know that there are people in this community and wherever you are online, there are people around you, if you're a Christian, who need someone just like you to naturally share the presence of Jesus. But I'm really quiet, I'm really shy, I'm afraid of talking a whole lot. God says, perfect. I need people just like that to reach certain people. But I'm loud, I'm sassy, I'm like, I'm, all, I'm out there. Perfect. God needs people just like that to share the gospel with certain people. You are just the right person to share the love of Jesus and the story of Jesus with somebody. If you'll pay attention, God has put them in your life or will in the coming days. Be ready and own your calling. Evaluate my schedule. Do I make time? to spend time with non-believers. We have a person who's part of Shoreline Church, uh, Walt and Liz Bennett. Uh, and Walt moved here to work in, in the business world. He worked in, in the insurance world here at a place just down the street here from, on 25, uh, on, on Garden, Garden Road here. And part of Shoreline Church and recognized that they lived in their neighborhood and didn't know any of the 35 people in the homes around them and lived there for years. God eventually called Walt to leave the business world and to become the leader of Organic Outreach International. But, but it began in his neighborhood. And so I, I asked Walt if he would share this amazing story about how God stirred his heart and his wife's heart to look at their neighborhood with all these people that they didn't know and said, God, could this change? Watch the screens and hear his story. So it was 2010 that Liz and I relocated to the Monterey area. Uh, started attending Shoreline Church. We're getting very involved. We're involved in organic outreach conferences. Uh, and it was about six years into that, in 2016, that uh, we sat down one morning over breakfast, looked at each other and said, you know, we know almost nobody in our neighborhood. Um, and, and that's not very organic uh, of us in terms of our outreach. And so we set about to change that. So we went around house to house, uh, one at a time, and about 35 homes invited everyone to come over to our home for uh, an open house barbecue one afternoon. 
And while they were there, we had a, a laptop opened up with a spreadsheet on it and encouraged everybody, if you're comfortable, put your information into this spreadsheet and I'll share it around with everyone afterwards. That way we all have everybody's contact information. Um, and that went really well. Almost all the, the families showed up. We only had one or two that were out of town uh, that weekend that we had that, that barbecue. Um, and then about a year later, Liz and I once again sitting around uh, over a meal and said, you know what, We nothing's really moved beyond that. It was great barbecue, it was great open house, everybody showed up. Uh, it's changed things a little bit, but not really. And so we decided we needed to take another step. And so uh, we thought about the fire pit we had in our backyard. That as a family, occasionally we would uh, have roast hot dogs on it, and just have some nice family time around it. We said, what if we open that up to the neighborhood? So we moved the fire pit out to the driveway in front left it there permanently in our driveway in, our, in front of our house. And I used that mailing list I put together the year before and sent an email out to everyone on a Monday and said, hey, this Friday, we're having Fire Pit Friday, the inaugural edition, uh, and encouraged everyone to stop by if they had a chance anytime between five o'clock and eight o'clock, we'd have hot dogs and, and uh, you know, bring a lawn chair. We'll just have some good social time together. And we started doing that once or twice a month and people showed up and we started deepening the relationships. And you know, I was able to share with some of the ministry trips I was doing and everybody knew us pastor. And But you know, we've been doing this a few years and said, yeah, it's really changed the dynamic of the neighborhood, but we really felt like we haven't been having deep spiritual conversations. We haven't been building those one-on-ones. Uh, and so we started talking about you know, maybe stopping, maybe this run its course, maybe it's time to stop. Um, and it was the same time we were having this conversation that literally within a few days, there was a knock on our door and it was our neighbor from across the street. And, and he said, hey, Walt, um, I, I have a, a project. I need help from you. I need to borrow your van with you if you can drive uh, really quick. And I said, absolutely. I dropped what we were doing. I we jumped in the car and we headed out. And on our way back, um, he got really solemn and he said, well, it, is it okay if I, if I ask you something? And I said, certainly. He said, well, you know, my wife uh, has been struggling with a recurrence of cancer. Um, and we've just found out recently that it's much more serious than we had hoped it would be. And in fact, she has a limited time left, months left. And he said, I, I grew up a Christian. I kind of wandered away from it. Um, her, her family, all her family are beating on her uh, that she has to, to come to know Christ. And she's actually shutting them down. She's so tired of hearing from them. But Walt, I know she would listen to you. The relationship, she trusts you folks. She respects you and Liz. Liz has been meeting with her and praying with her. Um, if you could just talk to her uh, sometime soon uh, and, and kind of go through and, and share Christ and uh, help her with that, I would really be appreciative. I said, I would love to do that. So I um, was all prepared. And then about two weeks later, I received another knock on my door. And it was him again. And he said, uh, Walt, I know you haven't had a chance to talk with her. Um, but I, I need to let you know she just passed away. And he said, but, but when I asked you, you had shared with me some things I could do and some conversations I could have. And I'll tell you, the last two days, I lay there in the bed with her and had those conversations and said, hey, I'm confident I'm going to see her in heaven. But Walt, when she was passing, she asked if I would make sure to ask you to preside over her memorial service and, and in that service to share the gospel. And uh, I, I said, absolutely, I would love to do that. And I did, and I shared the gospel, had some amazing conversations afterwards with, with folks, and, and God was moving. And what this demonstrated to us was that when we were questioning whether our obedience to God and, and inviting people into our home was making a difference, God was working behind the scenes, even though we couldn't see it. And we vowed at that moment that we will never stop doing Fire Pit Fridays, whether we see immediate results or not. We keep praying over it. We know God is on the throne. We know he is at work. Yeah. So what happens between, let's put our fire pit in the driveway and invite neighbors over on Fridays, and this woman becoming a Christian and saying, Walt, uh, asking that Walt would, at her funeral service, share the story of Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in between. But you don't find that out in a book. Uh, okay, I should put my fire pit in front of my home. What they did is they made time. They looked at their life and they said, here's something we can do to connect with people and share the love of Jesus. And God used that for years. God used that. I don't know what the next step is for you. But I know making time to be around the people that are part of your life that don't know Jesus, to love them well, to listen to them, to build friendships, and to be ready when, you, when you're ready to share your story 
and the simple story of Jesus with other people. This is part of our journey. Next step, make time to be available. Find a mentor. Find somebody who you respect who really naturally shares their faith. They're not creepy. They're not angry. They're not oppressive. They just love Jesus. And, they, and watch that person. Learn from that person and learn to share your faith like that. Count the cost. There's a cost of time. There's a, there's a cost when you're going to share the love of Jesus, when you're going to walk with people. But spend the time. And, and, and risk maybe somebody feeling a little uncomfortable sometime. It's, no, no one's going to take you out and, and burn your house down or, or take your life. That happens in some parts of the world, even today, if people share the gospel. That's not what we have here. So in our context, count the cost. It won't be that great, but there'll be a cost there. Live like Jesus. Every day, every moment, live like Jesus and speak like Jesus. Talk like Jesus. Share his story. Do your part to walk into the sharing of the love and the grace of Jesus. I want to share with you the simple story of Jesus. And you think, well, gosh, we're getting near the end of our service time. That's going to take an hour. No, it takes about two and a half minutes. To share the, you can share the whole story of Jesus in a couple of minutes. I want to share with you the simple story of Jesus for two reasons. One, for those of you that are Christians, to listen and recognize you can share the story of Jesus this simply. And also I want to speak to those who aren't yet Christians. That you would listen to this story, to hear the truth of the story, the good news of Jesus. And then I want to pray with those of you that are Christians. And I want to pray with those of you that aren't yet Christians. So here's the simple story of Jesus. There is a God who loves you. There is a God who made you, who knows everything about you, and he still loves you passionately. It all starts, the beginning point is the love of God, God's love. Here's the next thing, our problem. We as human beings have a problem. We've sinned. The Bible says everyone's sinned. Everybody's done wrong things. We've turned from God. We've gone our own way. We've sinned against God. And our sin separates us from each other, but it separates us from God. And that separation from God, we can't make the gap back and forth in our own power. So God's love, he loves us. Our problem is sin. Our words, our thoughts, our behaviors that are wrong, it separates us from God. But God's solution to our problem is Jesus. God's solution is that God came among us. Jesus was born. That's Christmas. He came. He lived in this world with no sin, with no wrong, and he died on the cross for our sins and our wrongs, the perfect lamb of God. God's solution is Jesus. And Jesus said, all who put their faith in me will come and be with me forever. God's solution is Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, and the offer of eternal life for all who receive his forgiveness, not our goodness, but his grace. God's love, he knows you and loves you. Our problem, sin separates us. God's solution is Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. There's one more part. Our response. Will we receive the gift of God that's already been paid for, offered through Jesus? He lived. He died in your place. He paid the price. He rose again. And he offers forgiveness. Our response is to say, Jesus, for all my wrongs, I confess. For all your goodness and right things, I accept those. I take hold of your hand and I'll follow you now and through all of eternity. You say, is the story that simple? It really is. And if you're a Christian, you know it's changed your life. So here's what I want to do as we close. I want to ask you, let's just kind of quiet our hearts, let's bow our heads, just have a quiet moment with Jesus. If you're at home or anywhere on campus and you have followed Jesus, you know without question you have given your heart to Jesus, you followed him, he is your savior, he's the leader of your life. And you want me to pray for you right now today that you would have a new boldness and a new commitment to share his love, to shine his light, to let his living water flow through you to scatter his seeds. You're just saying, you're saying, God, in natural, I don't, know, I don't want to freak people out. I don't want to freak myself out, but I want to share Jesus. If you're a Christian and you want me to pray for you to have new opportunities and new ways to share Jesus, I want you to raise your hand and raise it high and keep it in the air. If you say, I'm a Christian, I know I'm a Christian, but I'm saying right now, my hand in the air is saying to God, God, here I am. If you give me an opportunity, I'm going to love, I'm going to serve, I'm going to share. And just keep that hand in the air. Keep it in the air. Lord God, outdoors, at home, indoors here, we have hands lifted all over the place. Lord, would you look at us and see us like a little school kid who just says, choose me, choose me, teacher, choose me. Well, we want to say, God, Father, choose me. Use me to pray and love and serve and share your love with others. 
Lord, I'm available. I might be nervous. I might not quite know exactly what to do, but I'm saying, God, if you open the door, I'm going to love. I'm going to pray. I'm going to tell gently the story of how you changed my life. Just let that prayer settle in your heart. And just say in your heart, amen, in the name of Jesus, amen, may it be so. Okay, go ahead and put your hands down. And now just keeping our heads bowed and our hearts in a place of prayer. If you're at home, outdoors, family worship venue, or here in the worship center, and you say, until this moment, I've not really received Jesus and said I'm going to follow him and live for him. I've never made that commitment to follow and live for Jesus, but today I want to. This is my day. Wherever you are, I want to ask you to raise your hand. And just raise your hand and hold it high. And I'm going to say a prayer for you. So just raise your hand high at home, family worship venue out in the courtyard, wherever you are. Just raise your hand high. And keep your hand high as we pray this prayer. Let this be your prayer to the living God who loves you. Say, God, I don't have it all figured out yet. I don't have all the answers. But I raise my hand in my heart and I say, Jesus... I confess to you all my wrongs, all that I've done that's against you and against others. I give them to you. Jesus, wash me clean. Give me a new beginning. Wrap your arms around me right now. Wash my sins away. And now, Jesus, I take your hand. I don't just ask for you to forgive me of my wrongs. I ask you to take my hand and lead me forward in my life. Be my leader. Be my Lord, the guide of my life. Teach me how to live for you, to love you. And maybe, God, even to use me to share your love with someone else. If that's your prayer today, would you just say, Jesus, thank you. I pray this in your name. Keep your heart in a place of prayer. If that's your prayer, would you put your hand down now? And I want to invite you today, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, that second prayer, to say, Jesus, I didn't know you before, but I'm coming to know you now. I'm giving you my heart to follow you. If you prayed that prayer, if you're at home somewhere, if you're online, would you just pick up your phone and just text the word faith, F-A-I-T, you can see it on your screen, wherever, whatever kind of screen you're on right now. And if you're not on Sunday morning, but sometime in the weeks to come, you can still do this and we'll get the information. We'll follow up with you. If you will text the word faith to that number, we want to reach out to you and celebrate with you. We want to send you a beautiful Bible and a 50-day reading plan to get you reading the Bible. And we want to help you take next steps to grow in your faith. And if you're on the campus here, outdoors, family worship venue, in the worship center, if you're on campus and you prayed that second prayer, I want to ask you to do one thing before you leave. Before you leave, just come up front in the worship center. Sherry and I are up here. We had somebody who was out in the courtyard first service. But they came in to meet with us. We gave them a Bible. We want to give you a Bible. We want to pray with you and rejoice with you. And we want to talk about how you can now start that journey of walking with Jesus. Lord Jesus, for all of us this day, we thank you that you gave your life you offered yourself. You've washed us clean. You came to seek and save the lost. And many of us were lost, but we have been found. So now, Jesus, we simply say we join you on your mission to seek and save the lost. Here we are, Lord. We're available. Use us, we pray, to share your love and grace for the glory of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen. Before I invite you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give just a couple of words of invitation. The first is that this Wednesday night, it is my favorite Wednesday night of the month. It's actually, I think, my favorite night of the month. We gather on the first Wednesday of the month for night of worship. We're right here in the worship center and online and outdoors. So if you want to be online, that's fine, outdoors or in the worship center. But it's going to be an amazing night of worship. We're going to share communion. We're going to sing together. We're going to study God's word together. We're going to study Psalm 51. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And that's actually a time, 40 days, kind of before Easter and the celebration of Easter, leading up to Easter, where people reflect on the greatness of God's grace and the reality of our sin, why Jesus had to come and give his life on the cross. And so I want to invite you to join us. For a, for, a, for a Ash Wednesday service at 615 in the worship center online and at home. In the worship center here, we're not only going to share communion, but we're also going to have stations where if you want to go to them and have the sign of the cross and ash put on your forehead, which some church traditions, that's a normal part. We don't do that kind of stuff at Shoreline a lot, but we want to offer that for those who want it. And also a word of blessing to understand the greatness of God's grace in your life. 
And as you battle with sin, as you recognize his grace, to walk in that grace. So we're going to have a very special, powerful service this Wednesday at 615. We invite you to join us. And then also, if you need prayer for anything, a joy or a need, whatever it is, if you need prayer, uh, you, can, you can join us. If you're on campus, just come in the, on the far ends they'll be of the worship center. There'll be teams ready to pray for you. They're honored to pray for you. If you're online, just call the number you see online or text to the email address there what your prayer needs are. We will pray for you. If you're new at Shoreline, we want to give you a warm personal welcome. So if you're on campus, before you leave, go right into the, into the, into the lobby here into the Connection Center. They want to give you a little gift bag. Thank you for coming, answer your questions. So if you're on campus, don't leave without saying hi to the folks in the Connection Center. If you're online, just text the word welcome and we will get a hold of you and reach out to you and we want to give you a special welcome. And finally, if you prayed to receive Jesus today, if you prayed that second prayer, uh, we want to uh, give you a new Bible. We want to give you a 50-day reading plan and some next steps you can think about. Do you want to be baptized? Do you want someone to one-on-one mentor you? Do you want to get involved in a small group? We want to connect you in any way you want to be connected for spiritual growth. So if you're online, again, just text the word faith and then within the next 48 hours, we will reach out to you personally and, and make sure we get an address to send you a Bible and connect with you. If you're on campus, my wife Sherry and I are going to be standing right here in the middle on the side over here by the steps and just come talk with us. And we had great conversations with people after the first service. We hope that if you prayed that prayer, you'll come forward and join us if you're on campus. If you're able to stand, will you stand with me? And let me send you off with a word of blessing. As we close this time together, may you walk every single day naturally in the presence of Jesus, organically being his disciple. May you grow in love with him May you see his face every day. And as you walk into this world, may the light and love of Jesus reflect off your life to every person you meet. And if they ask you why, point to him. Let them know the love of Jesus. God bless you. Have a great next couple days. And we'll see you Wednesday night, 6.15 at night of worship. God bless you. Have a great week.